Okay, we are now recording. Yo, 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 yo. What's up, everybody? My name is Jawan Rohan. This is the Misguided Podcast, where we intend to guide you to a better future. I'm sitting here with Demetrius Wright, a real estate entrepreneur. Good morning, my brother. Good morning. Good morning. How you feeling so far today? You know, I feel good. Like you said, uh, alive and well, right? Alive and well. That's what we can ask for. Um, so I, I'm I'm in a good space right now. I got I'm meeting with some real estate clients today. Um, actually, right after this podcast. So, uh, you know, there's money to be to be made today. Hopefully, so for sure, <laughs> for sure. How you feeling? Uh, likewise, bro. Like I'm alive and well, and uh, I believe that that's half the battle. You know what I'm saying? I got a roof, clothing, food, shelter, the essentials, and uh, with that being yeah. said, I can't complain. I can, yeah. but I won't. So. <laughs> true, true. You could always complain, no matter how much sure. money you got, whatever you got, you can always complain. You got any plans for today? Um, similar to you, immediately following this interview, uh, I have some preview schedule for some real estate opportunities afterwards. So I'm here in Northeast Ohio. The weather has been beautiful the last week. So today is a uh, great day to get out there and preview some opportunities. So that's, that's definitely in the books for today. That's funny. Cause like this last week, the weather has been really good here and literally everyone has just been like, Hey, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's, let's tour. Let's tour. It's like, I thought, I for thought sure. you were worried about interest rates. <laughs> what happened right. to that? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. 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 Um, so it's never when it, it's funny, it's funny dealing with clients, real estate clients. Cause they're just, they just, they're like the best liars. Right. So, yeah yeah they're just like i don't want to be bothered now until i bo I'll bother you right and so um then they come out of crawling out of the the corners of the the freaking uh house like ants uh it's it's funny but um i like to tell the audience how i met you um and so i'll, I'll give a little introduction so one day i was just scrolling on twitter and came across this thread that was kind of like building up right <laughs> um had multiple retweets and, and and likes and i think uh we i don't know if we have a mutual friend andre hatchet but he had uh, yeah. okay okay he had commented mm -hmm. on your stuff and um and that's a close friend of mine and, and mentor he actually helped me a lot um and so i i looked at your story and for those listening, his story was saying that he, you know, he started uh, doing real estate investing. And you can correct me if if uh, I'm not mm -hmm. remembering uh, correctly. He started doing real estate investing, and it was hard. The, the shit's hard. Like, <laughs> uh, it's it's not easy for everyone. Um, but did really well. Did really well at one point, and then um, things kind of took a turn, right? Uh, whether it's personal stuff or or real estate stuff, we'll get into it. Um, but then he mm -hmm. had to go back to a salary job, and um, he wanted everyone to know that he's not ashamed of that, right? And so I really appreciated that because sometimes you need that. Sometimes you either take the jump too early, right? Or sometimes you take the jump and things go wrong and you have to go back and do what you got to do and take that jump again. And that's okay. And so that's why I wanted to bring him on this podcast. Um, because that's the point is we're going to guide you to a better future by, by sharing his story. So, um, was I right? Was I correct? I yeah. Remember. Yeah. I, yeah. You pretty much hit that in a nutshell for sure. So cool, cool. dig into it. Let's go. All right. Let's talk about where you're from, man. I am from, I'm currently in Akron, Ohio. I'm from East Lake, Ohio. Both cities are about 20 minutes north and south of Cleveland. So Cleveland, Ohio is the hub. Uh, I've spent the overwhelming majority of my whole entire life in a suburb about 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes outside of Cleveland. So that's 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 hometown, Cleveland, Ohio. So you're a LeBron fan? I am a LeBron fan for sure. I like how you said that. I'm not yeah, a Lakers yeah. fan, but I'm a LeBron. You're a LeBron. Fan yeah, I got sure. you. I got you. Okay, cool, cool. Now that makes sense. Uh, yeah. How you feel about his last performance, though? Um, I, you know, I feel like they maxed out their potential. I feel like LeBron individually, absolutely, you can't argue that he's maxing out his potential at 38 years old in his 20th season. And uh, you know, he was on a team that prior to the midway point before the All Star break was out of the playoff picture, you know, yeah. and they banged it out with the best team in the, looks like the best team in the league in the conference finals. So, I mean, yeah. that's pretty much, I, I feel like he did all he could with what he had. Nah, that's true. I think it's funny because like, he's still the best player in the world at 38. Like he's still the best. And 
you can tell when he like isn't trying. You can tell when mm-hmm. he turns it on, no one can stop him. Like when he drives to For the basket sure. and is like, I need to score because I look bad right now, no one's stopping him. But then For sure. about 93% of the game, he has it off, right? And Absolutely. that's why they don't win. Um, and I think I think the moment his son gets to the NBA, he's going to retire. He just needs one photo and one game with his son or one season, and he's gonna he's gonna retire after that. Yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll see what happens there because he mentioned something in the presser after that conference was over, and he said that that was his dream. That's not yeah. necessarily Bronny's dream. So that was the first time that I even myself was like, mm. <laughs> like we haven't really like you know what I'm saying. Like yeah, yeah. I'm sure we can all attest to you know, having fathers, or maybe some of us didn't have fathers in our life, that might not be, that made a lot of sense. You yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, a, that's that's LeBron's dream. That's not necessarily Bronny. So, you know, we'll see if he hangs around or not. Like, that would be another major milestone and uh, something that we've never seen before. But I'm not so sure that we, we might get to see that. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But anyways, yeah. um, from Cleve or from uh, Ohio, um and, and kind of and grew up there tell me a little bit about your background um did you you know after high school um how were you as a kid um my background is i come from regular middle class suburban you know what i mean no silver spoon but no struggle you know okay. growing up i didn't really feel see or sense significant lack or significant struggle um coming both straight parents, out of- both parents stayed together Correct. Correct. My parents are a little bit older. Both parents stay together. My father now has since passed probably six or seven years ago when I was 25, but my mother's still here. Um, but I had both parents in the home, um, regular vanilla middle cookie cutter suburb <laughs> lifestyle coming up. Um, took a vacation every now and again. You know, I didn't feel lack and I didn't feel struggle as a child. Yeah. And cu- coming out of the home in high school, I went, I came from East Lake to Akron, which is about an hour away, just the other side, south of Cleveland, and um, was in college because I thought, you know, that was a narrative that I bought into after school, you go to college, get your education, get a good job, and um, failed. I, I was, I know that's becoming sexy to suggest <laughs> that um, I wasn't a good student, but I really was not a good student. And, and why, why do you think that, why do you think that is? You just couldn't focus? Um, yeah, I just was completely and totally in, in, in the essence of this statement, like just uninterested in what they had to offer to teach me. You know mm. what I'm saying? So even in high school, my mother will tell you, like, she doesn't know how I graduated. I graduated <laughs> with a 1.8 accumulative GPA. Get I out. have my high school transcript. Like, <laughs> so like before it became like a popular thing for people yeah. to say now, like that was real for me. I showed up, I stayed out of trouble, but man i was just a very uninterested unengaged unenthused student what'd you study in college or try to study (laughs) Uh, i tried to study um i think it was geez i don't even remember probably like come on man you ain't you ain't that old come on (laughs) listen listen. but you know again i was there because i was supposed to be there i think it was phys ed physical education or exercise science because i figured like hey being a gym teacher or something athletic would be an easy degree yeah, I just yeah. want easy courses, an easy degree to do something that I think I would enjoy later on. So you went to but, college for the women, really, huh? That's what it was. That, yeah, <laughs> that's what I. That's what it ended up being. Yeah, yeah. I definitely <laughs> went there for the women, but was academically dismissed from college twice. Mm. Um, and yeah, that that didn't work out. <laughs> okay, okay. So after college, uh, what do you get into? What's your first job? Well, after college, what I get into is my first job job was retail sales at Verizon Wireless. Okay. And I did really, really good at the retail sales position. Those can be really good and lucrative, I've heard. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that was the time and era, let's say 2013, 14. The commercials. Tablets and Mm -hmm. yeah, business to business sales. So I, I crushed that role. And at that time, I'm still 23, 24, 25 make it anywhere from 60 to 70 grand selling phones like welcome to Verizon how can I help you yeah just retail sales and um did that for about three four years maybe five and was recruited into real estate you know, okay that, that's how I got into my real estate journey from doing that retail sales realtors would come in I'd sell them phones tablets mobile hotspots 
worked with a lot of business accounts and I literally had a stack of business cards from people suggesting that I should sell real estate and uh, was recruited into that industry that way. So then you got into becoming a real estate agent. Correct. Right. Okay. So you get into real estate. Um, what brokerage are you working with and how's that first year, obviously getting into real estate, that's a huge hit. And, and especially if you have like no other additional income, you're just relying on a home being sold. Talk about Correct. it. Correct. Correct. So, um, like you said, get into real estate. The first brokerage that I connected to was Keller Williams mm -hmm. here in Northeast Ohio, a local, local Keller Williams here in Northeast Ohio. And, um, now mind you as well, when I left the retail and got into real estate, I had newly married wife's pregnant with, I had two kids already from college. So like you said, I, I was there for the you women. Were, you were there. <laughs> I, I got there for the women. So I brought two kids to our marriage. She brought one kid to our marriage at the time we had, she had one in the oven. So there's you got a kids. full house. Correct. Oh, and, and brand you new took this. Yeah. <laughs> correct. And we're starting a new real estate journey Ooh. in a market that I wasn't necessarily well rooted in because this yeah. is the same city I went to college in. So this isn't my hometown. We're starting off as a traditional retail realtor. We get our license. We do the real estate classes. And now it's like, this is my first taste and experience of you eat what you kill. Yeah. And, Does um, your wife at this point have like a job? At that point she did, but it okay. was, this, this was her last job. I think, you know, after she had that baby, which was maybe six months after I started the real estate journey, she hadn't worked since. So, um, let's just, for the sake of the conversation, let's say she did, she, did, her job wasn't significant to, the bills the, our livelihood <laughs> yeah, right yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. i um, got you yeah so it, it it was a it was a new thing i had got licensed i'm fully active and it was like i show up to the office every day and it's like my first taste of like me having to generate my own leads and generate my own business and this was before teams were super popular real estate mm -hmm. teams nowadays mm -hmm. people who get their license newly they immediately join a team they're yeah. encouraged and you know suggested to join a team at first especially when they link with the bigger brokerages yep like howard hannah keller williams join a team they'll feed you some leads they'll show you some ropes you'll do the dirty work for them until you can stand on your own too but that wasn't as they were around but it wasn't as popular yeah. of a strategy getting into real estate so fast forwarding i spent about six months doing open houses um knocking on doors just really grass level marketing advertising trying to generate a listing you know i yeah. had a couple agents that took me under their wings and was like hey be my assistant i'll show you what to do but it was rough i, I didn't understand how to generate my own business um doing that so fat I, I don't know if you have another question or some no you I got get I, too I, deep into that no yeah yeah so um so you're in real estate when did you how long did it take to get your first closing mm, about six months about yep. four to six months before i got my own i was working with a buyer mm -hmm. who was referred to me um, I think it was someone from my sphere of influence or maybe somebody that saw on Facebook that I was promoting being an agent and, uh, I got my first buyer client. So that was a side of the, you remember that first check? Around. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do remember that first check. It, it was probably about two grand, 2,400 bucks. Cause here in Northeast Ohio at that time, this is 2016, 17, you know, this house was maybe 40,000 bucks. I mean, it was a rundown. They were looking for a fixer up or something affordable. They paid cash. Um, so that commission on my side was probably about two grand. Wait, hold on. 40,000 um, and two grand. That's a pretty, what the hell? What, what, uh, what's your commission, uh, split out there? Not split, well, but percentage. Right. See, there's a baseline in a, in Northeast Ohio because the price point gets so, so small of mm. $4,000. At the oh. time, that's what it was for Keller Williams. Okay, okay, okay. Um, and the listing agent was like with Cutler. So like every brokerage in Northeast Ohio has a flat, four, you know, it's either 2% or six on the first 100,000, four on the remainder. 
or the splits go up crazy when the price point gets high, but there's a bottom, there's a baseline of when you're listing a house, uh, that's standard practice of $4,000 for the majority of these bigger brokerages. Yeah, no, that makes if sense. You, Cause I was like, how do you survive off a $40,000 home? Or like exactly. selling that home, like you wouldn't be able to. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was, that was, uh, and then the split that 4,000, I'm assuming was their baseline mm -hmm. at, you know, so they get 2000, I get 2000 split it with the brokers. I think I probably cleared maybe a grand, something like that. $1,200 of the not even cause, ta was, cause taxes. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. And that's pre-tax. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, a lot of realtors in the beginning, forget about that. Like I when I got like my first big check which was like around eight thousand dollars i'm like oh my god that is nice yeah. right but then it's like oh three thousand of that I gotta go bye-bye at the end of the mm -hmm. year right like absolutely uh, so annoying so you know california too is, is terrible with taxes so um yeah it, it's it's definitely eye-opening um when you sure. get that first big check and i remember my team lead telling me like yo when you get the, that big check it's gonna be like what <laughs> yeah. he's like and that's gonna motivate you i was like it for sure did um so a little bit of background about my story uh in real estate as an agent i worked with fly homes which was like redfin 12 years ago they focused on like fintech ideas so mm -hmm. the the buy before you uh sell program mm -hmm. and they focused on all cash offers before it became really popular now um they right. were they started in 2015 to 2016 they were cool because they were really good for new agents. So a new agent comes in, they're getting salary. I was salary right. at first, right? So it's like, hey, we're gonna give you all the leads. Don't worry about it. Here goes leads. You close, you get like a flat fee. Depending on mm -hmm. what agent status you are, you'll get mm -hmm. like either 2,000, 2,500, 3,000, whatever. Um, and you're getting salary. And it was pretty good. It was like $30 an hour, right? Sure. And so going into real estate first year, I'm like, oh, that sounds great. I get to learn real estate. I get to like, just I learn it and, and build up in, in confidence, right? And I don't have to Absolutely. struggle uh, about where my next paycheck is coming because I just had two kids, right? Like, right. Um, so that was really cool. Yeah, I, I, I was at Fly Homes for two years, possibly. Um, and then uh the we had the it was right after the pandemic i had got fired from coca-cola and then found fly homes and then recession hits and they started doing layoffs they did their they, they did their layoffs their first round of layoffs in july of last year i made the cut i was like how did i make the cut because like i'm i'm one of the newer guys right? right i mean i did close some deals so that was cool but like how did i make the cut you feel me right i'm like all right they're definitely going to do another one because the economy is going to get worse. This was July. Everyone was still like partying yeah. it up. Right. <laughs> and so um, I'm like, definitely around December is when they're going to do more cuts. So I was just ready, kind of preparing, talking to other brokerages, ready to take that next step. They did it in, in November. They did again mm -hmm. in November. And I got let go in November along with a, a lot of other people. Um, I saw at this point, they cut like 60 percent of their workforce which was, mm. which was insane. They're a tech startup, you know, they're, they, they're, this is investors money. This isn't sure. like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, and now as you can see all the tech companies in San Francisco are bye-bye. Um, so yeah, that was a huge transition for me from, from that salary job getting laid off. I got laid off two times in two years. So I really you know, like related to your story of trying the entrepreneurship going back, trying the entrepreneurship right and then going yeah. back and so um that was huge for me now i'm with twin oaks um which is a, a you know it's mom and pop brokerage and and they do mm -hmm. it traditionally 70 30 uh, for new agents um and then you get the big check instead of salary sure so yeah it's definitely a transition for sure that's dope bro yeah yeah, yeah. Stuff. tell me a little bit about um your journey when you're selling real estate when how long did it take you to get like that momentum of where you're closing kind of one, at least one every month. Gotcha. So, so fast forwarding, I'm doing the retail thing for the six months, got my first deal. And, uh, after that first deal, I developed a niche of working with investor clients because due to the lack of business that I had, but the amount of time that I had and my, I guess, green behind the ears, I was the agent that didn't mind showing 
investors and most retail agents don't like working with investors because it's the low dollar amount houses, the dilapidated houses, the things of that nature that more bigger successful agents just, they don't really want to waste time with that. That's lower commissions. They don't want to preview it's those type of houses. It's crazy because like yeah. even here, and sorry, I didn't mean to in interrupt, but okay. even here in California, it's not really low commissions and um, it's preferred to work with investors because they're always shopping. Working with first time right. home buyers, it's like, all right, interest rates are up. Oh, sorry. I read the news. I read CNN. Right. I don't want to buy a home right now. They said we should wait. There's a crash coming. Right. Like, no. Right. Right. It's like investors are always hungry. So I actually prefer that. But sorry. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. and that's the difference between the markets. So investors yeah. here, we're looking for properties anywhere between five grand especially at that time like anywhere from five grand to 50 on the high end yeah would yeah be yeah. like an investment opportunity in northeast ohio so agents are like nah, i don't got time for that those are in the bad neighborhoods those are the dirty dilapidated houses those are the bare minimum commissions but it's like i had nothing else to do so i would ride around with an agent and look at hot properties all afternoon that are yeah, you yeah. know what i mean that, that we're crawling through the basement and hoarder houses and things like that so I developed a niche and relationship with active investors who are fixing and flipping, looking at rentals until fast forwarding. One day I meet with a guy um, who I had done a bunch of buyers and transactions on the investment side retail who said, hey, partner with me um, and let's attack short sales. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, once again, no agents wanted to do short sales. He needed an agent who could partner with him he, 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 to, to complete those deals. And that didn't work. But what ended up working is he got bogged down on the construction side of his fix and flip business. Okay. And I became his acquisition specialist before that term and that um, position became like a well known popular thing now. Yeah, yeah. now so it's like, a hey, TikTok he, thing. <laughs> exactly. So now people kind of understand wholesaling and investment and things like that. So we're all looking for a boots on the ground, active acquisitions person, manager. Yeah. Uh, and I became that for him. You know, I um, previewed all the properties, um, put deals under contract, and he managed the construction side. Mm -hmm. And then when the properties were done, uh, being fixed and flipped, I would retail them on the back end side, retail list them as an agent on the back end side for a premium commission. That's mm -hmm. kind of how I got paid. You know, I got like premium listing prices to market those properties. And he started off giving me like an hourly base salary when I was making cold calls and putting out guerrilla marketing and things like that. But the commissions were so high. You know what I mean? I was charging them flat 7% on the listing side. And these are brand new fixed up nice houses now. So to your point, I'm getting eight to 12,000 mm -hmm. and he was shooting them out like, you know, one or two per month. So it's like, hey, this is working out. Um, fast forwarding. So I did that from 2017 to about 2019. To your point, the pandemic hits. And we grew that thing. You know, we had two crews going. We're flipping a bunch of houses. And he got bottlenecked trying to manage the construction mm -hmm. of the flips. And I was, and it got to a point where I was kind of sitting around like, hey, I'm white hot in my skill set of, acquisitions, you know, mm -hmm. converting leads, um, getting signed contracts and, you know, regardless of whether they were probate leads or pre foreclosure leads, like I was really good on the phone, connecting with motivated sellers, getting properties under contract, and then just moving and shaking on the acquisitions and disposition side. Okay. So it got to the point where he couldn't figure out how to turn over the flips fast enough to where it was halting. We were turning off the marketing. And I'm sitting around like, hey, I can't work or generate any more business for our entity because we can't get the rehabs done fast enough. So that's how we, we started off wholesaling. And again, I just churned and burned through all those leads, generated some money wholesaling to at one point it was like, he even knew his own self. He's like, I can't keep up on the back end <laughs> side with yeah. your acquisitions. And now I'm bottlenecking your income, which was my income. Um, so the, at the end of the pandemic, that fall of 2020, I started wholesaling myself. Okay. So now I, I still have my real estate license, but I'm operating 100% off market as my own entity, created my own LLC and started off assigning contracts. The fall of 2020, wholesaling okay. on my own as my own entity, still had a license. 
So I was generating a bunch of leads. You know, I had a dialer, was doing bandit signs, cold calling, direct mail, all those things um, going into 2021. And, uh, you know, I, I hit the ground running. At that time, uh, if it didn't make sense for me to put it under contract for cash, I would still list it. You know, I would still offer a bare minimum listing commission. I would only make them sign two week listing agreements because it's like, hey, if we can't sell it within two weeks at the price you're asking for, and that was a way for me to still stay connected. If I needed to buy the property at 50,000, they wanted to sell it at 80,000. Okay, let's put it on the open market for two weeks. That would convince them to sign it. And uh, if we couldn't sell it, it's like, hey, the market spoke for yourself, but I'm still here to buy it at that price. So um, it was kind of like a hybrid agent. That makes sense. Wholesaler kind yeah. of situation. Yeah. So hit that ground running. We're in 2021. I'm maybe doing four or five deals a month. I hired virtual assistants to do cold calling and marketing and text message blasting and ringless voicemail, the whole nine. Got my own office. I have my own acquisition specialist live in person. And uh, then we just kind of, that's when the personal stuff kind of hit, the, the, the little personal storms in my life via the divorce that I mentioned in that tweet. Um, and this was the first time ever that I've had more money in my checking account. Um, than I've ever had more. How much are you making in. monthly? Like uh, um, gross and net? I would say gross, maybe 45,000 from November of 2020, 2020 till like July of 2021. Oh, so you, yeah. And you in Cleveland too. You just, you Correct. living it up too. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Correct. So now the kids are in private school. The wife's <laughs> yeah. got new truck. Like, you know what I'm saying? Wife like got her nails done every, every, yeah, every, every two yeah, days. Every, yeah, everything is good. You know yeah. what I mean? Like we're making some steady, consistent income. And then that personal storm came. You know, she, you know, wife says she's unhappy. That brings. Do you mind? Yeah. talk. Do you mind diving into that? I mean, you're pretty yeah, open yeah, can, on, on Twitter. So, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about kind of how that divorce came about Um, and, and, and maybe, you know, how. Yeah, talk about it. Go ahead. Sure, 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 sure. So uh, at this point, we had been married about five years. And that first two to three years, there was a lot of struggle. You know, mm -hmm. we both, if if truth be told, and it should probably weren't ready or didn't understand the magnitude and the fullness of marriage. Okay, We were both kind of at a place where young, I got married at 26. She was 25. Like I said, I already had two kids. She had one. We had one right away. So trying to be married with a house of four as a brand new entrepreneur, you know, as the primary source of income, I don't think either of us really understood the magnitude of what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was kind of conducive to the downfall a couple years later. And uh, because again, the first two, three years, there was a lot of struggle, a mm -hmm. lot of figuring things out, a bunch of kids in the house, lots of struggle. I'm trying to build this business, get it off the ground. She's at home with the kids. So it definitely lacked, um, you know, as the man and as the provider of your household, you know, you're not, it's hard to focus on romance and intimacy and fun and entertainment and things like that when you're in survival mode, when you're operating in survival mode. Very true. And then, uh, and then vice versa too, is it's hard to kind of make that transition when you're with the kids all day and you're thinking about how to clean up the house and, and stuff. So yeah, for sure. I get that. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in summary, um, now that things are great in end of 2020, 2021, I suppose it was kind of too late. You know what I mean? Mm. She was dissatisfied um you know to the extent where she just she just wanted out we're young things are getting better um maybe i don't want this you know maybe i don't want to be here like so in summary like that to me came as a surprise you know okay. some some people can it came out of nowhere that was the first time that i was made aware that she was dissatisfied to the point that she wanted it to end mm -hmm. so it ended quickly it ended abruptly it ended like, wow, like here I am, well, I finally turned the corner, we finally figured this out. You know, some people can look at that situation like, hey, look how far we've come and it's only been six years. And then another party can look at that situation like, I've been in this for six years and we're just like, I can't, you know what I mean? Like hold on any longer. So long story short, I tried to buy it back. I tried to buy it back. I bought new vehicles and Louis bags and Gucci rags and counseling and, but it was too late. 
Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? To, to my point, it was too late. And what that did is July of 2021 to the end of the year, you know, I was unfunctional. Mm. I was complete, like everything. That's when it started to kind of fall apart. Um, I got evicted from that office that I had. Um, I lost some, all my employees that I had and I only had one live employee and two virtual assistants, but I became completely and totally unfunctional. Detached. I wasn't showing up. Yeah. I wasn't showing up to work. I depleted all my savings and she ended up leaving close to Christmas time that year. So fast forwarding, we get to 2022. I have to find a new place to stay, you know, figure it out. We get to mid summer of 2022. That's when the divorce actually finalized. Um, and I really kind of survived off my reserves for about six months to almost a year. I still did a handful of wholesale assignment deals um, to kind of sustain me. But this is as a one man band. I still have some tools, my dialer, my software, my things of that nature. Um, but that upward trajectory that I was on for about eight months putting the systems and process together of a real business. Like I found my skill set, I found my space. We're on an upward trajectory. It's a white hot space. Then that, you know, personal storm kind of halted that momentum. Um, you know, I was unable to endure that personal hit and maintain functionality on the on the professional side. So how was the effect on the kids? I know that must have been hard bringing two families blended together. And then with, you know, your kid that you guys had, how's the co-parenting? Yeah. Um, we have two together, two boys oh, okay. that are two years apart. And um, you know, it happened so quickly and so abruptly that um and now she's back close. She's about an hour away from me. And um, my one son I have with me here in Akron, my oldest son's in Columbus, and now I have two in Cleveland. So now they're all over the place. I go yeah. from all of them except my one son in Columbus in my household to them being all over the place. So it, it's cordial. Um, it's as cordial as it possibly can be. But in terms of the kids, like a part of the current season struggle that I'm in now is navigating you know, children in three different spaces mm. and, you know, prioritizing my livelihood as now an individual while showing up in my availability to all of them yeah. and financially contribute to all of them has been a challenge. For sure. For so sure. we get to, in summary, to summarize that whole part, we get 2022 was all kind of like healing. You know, mm -hmm. she had left. It was the first full calendar year of me being a single person. I still had some reserves. I still was doing a deal or two here or there, but I only did about four or five deals in 2022 and made over six six figures mm -hmm. off of just four to six assignment transactions. Um, so 2023 comes, it's like, okay, I've got an idea of the new norms. First calendar year of a single person. I'm gonna get back on my horse. Everything's gonna be great. I feel better. Mm -hmm. I understand the new norms. Let's get it going. Daddy. And now here we are in June of 2023. And I've done one real estate deal all year. I've done one deal all year. That's it. Um, so which 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 caused me to make that post recently that suggests like this is the first time in eight years where I've had to get a job. Mm -hmm. I work at FedEx at Graveyard as a package handler and i actually just picked up a second gig you know helping one of my friends in his landscaping company literally just to make ends meet um the market has shifted ever so slightly that it's just a little bit more challenging of a market the bottom hasn't fallen out the wholesale space is extremely competitive mm -hmm. um the market that i'm operating in is relatively small this isn't houston this isn't you know a big big huge market and I think we've washed, rinsed, and repeated this Akron, Northeast Ohio market so many times over. And the, it, it's just deals are few and far between. And uh, again, this is something that I didn't foresee. Um, mm -hmm. So here we are, you know, navigating what I was once doing that was working really, really well, isn't quite working. I didn't foresee it. Um, and just the ebbs and flows of entrepreneurship you know, yeah. operating in a place in a space that, hey, it's it's seasonal, it operates in cycles, 
Uh, it operates in seasons and, um, you know, I, it, you know, just in a, in a, in a somewhat of a storm, just trying it's to yeah. yeah, the market, the market is, is, is weird too right now. So, um, that, that also plays into part as well. Sure. Um, but I want to, I want to backtrack a little bit back to the marriage part. Um, you know, we, we actually haven't had in-depth conversations about marriages and kind of the struggle of marriages for you, where would you say, if you can go back, mm -hmm. where would you say you would have improved? A hundred percent. Um, I like that question and we can mm -hmm. definitely dig into the marriage part. Um, you know, it, it goes back to, I've learned about the sin of omission and the sin of commission. So when we make mistakes in life and when bad things happen, it's not always about the bad things that we didn't, that it's not always about the bad things that we did do. It's about the good things that we didn't do. Okay. Um, and an example that I have of that is as my marriage fell apart and when I was in that storm, I was really, for lack of better words, dumbfounded because it's like, I'm a good guy. You know what I mean? I'm treating you right. I'm faithful. I'm trying to build this business and provide for our family. Like, how could something like this happen? But to your question, it's just like, it wasn't about a bunch of bad things that I did that contributed to, you know, my part of it falling apart. It was about the good things that I was neglecting doing. And That's, as the man of yeah. a household, like the essence of a man and being a man is like taking ownership for everything. So not to get too spiritual, but I have a good, I have a good analogy of this. It's like Adam and Eve, right? Um, Eve ate the fruit, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the downfall of humanity and us living in paradise. And then the first person that God confronted about that was Adam. Mm -hmm. And he was like, God was like, Adam, what happened? And he was like, I didn't do anything. Like, what do you mean? Like what happened? I didn't do that. She did it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And God was like, but that's the, that's the problem. You didn't do anything. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's my issue. Like you didn't do anything. So the, the biggest takeaways for me in my marriage is although it's just like, I could have been much more proactive in prioritizing the connection and intimacy with my spouse. Mm -hmm. So irregardless of the reason why I'm not doing those things or focused in prioritizing on those things are good things. We can get distracted with good things. Mm -hmm. We can be off course doing the right things, but just in, irregardless of if your spouse says, Hey, it's okay. I understand, you know, what you're trying to do, what we're trying to build. So I don't need all those things that you, you should still carve out a time, a space to prioritize connect. and connect and mm -hmm. be intimate and romantic and, you know, making your person feel special. You can't just yeah. zero, you can't just go all <laughs> in on any particular area in marriage and leave any aspect of it just completely depleted. Yeah. Facts. Um, how in 2023 we're in June now, shit, we're in June. Um, we are in June. <laughs> that's crazy. Sure. How, how's the healing? I know it still hurts. I know there's still a hole there. Sure. How you, it, How you doing? It's it's uh, and I appreciate you asking that too because I feel like men in particular, number one, men experience the short end of the stick in relationships too. You know, I yep. feel like we've heard the story, we've seen the movie, we've read the novel of the broken-hearted woman or a mm -hmm. woman that gets the short end of the stick in relationships. But there are decent men also who have negative relational experiences, not due to anything significantly negative they did mm -hmm. you know they just got the short end of the stick and that story isn't necessarily like that man the narrative is that man isn't allowed to, to cry out and say yeah, hey yeah. you know what i mean like i'm healing or suffering or in some type of emotional pain or distraught due to my negative relational experience for sure um, we're kind of just like hey deal with it tough it out so i appreciate you asking me that and um that healing process is it's going well because I'm being intentional about the work that needs to be done. And it, it, the one thing that I've learned about divorce, again, not to be too spiritual, but again, marriage is a spiritual entity in my opinion. It's uh, no matter what, it's destructive. 
I don't think any party in a divorce can make can go through with that divorce and it's imminently a significantly forward move mm. for anybody involved, not mm -hmm. for the kids, not for the person who wanted it or didn't want it. I mean, you built a life together. Um, so it, it's, it, there's going to be elements of destructiveness for lack of better words that, you know, are less than ideal. So the healing journey is going really, really well. And, you in therapy? Uh, I am. I That's do. Good. I, I, yes, I do talk to the same counselor that we were trying to work thing out. You know, I have spiritual leaders and a, a good tribe of people that um, help me deal with that. But, uh, you know, just, just feeling the feels, acknowledging it is what it is and, uh, you know, adjusting to the new norms. But yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes sense. So I appreciate the, the transparency and openness on that. Um, what about real estate? Um, you know, kind of that transition like i gotta admit man you, you, it's back-to-back -back hits right and and i i appreciate you for yeah. staying strong you know but mentally that's got to be tough on someone just that just went through a divorce then you try and get back into the only thing you knew which is real estate and then mm -hmm. come to find out it's like fuck, i don't know this anymore <laughs> right right so mentally Going back, going back to a job, FedEx, that's got to be tough on you. How is that? Man, you, you hit that nail dead on the head. The first two days that I was supposed to start and do that, mm -hmm. I called off mm -hmm. because psychologically I couldn't, it wasn't about the physicality and it wasn't even about the pride in yeah. a sense of like, I'm above this. It was literally when you wake up every day for eight years straight and bet on yourself, yeah. and attain certain type of success, you almost reprogram yourself to suggest that like, this is not a way that makes sense to me to generate income. This exchange for time and money doesn't make sense to me psychologically. Mm -hmm. Like this isn't, you know, so it was more so a lot of psychological warfare to like suggest to myself, like this doesn't make sense. Like yes. this time exchange and the money exchange does not make any sense. So, um, mentally that that was a challenge but it had gotten to the point and and that's why i got so bad to the point i needed a job because that belief in my ability to get a deal was just like because again that's a question that's asked often too like well how could it get so bad it's like if you've been in on this side of the fence for this long and learned how to navigate the ebbs and flows of real estate and gone four weeks six weeks ten weeks without a check and figured it out like no one could have made me to believe that one, two, three, four, five months were gonna go by and I couldn't generate a deal mm -hmm. until I zeroed out and didn't get a deal. You yeah, know what yeah. I'm saying? So yeah. it's like, okay, we're here because we literally, you know, if we don't punch this time clock, I don't eat. Yeah. So yeah. Ir irregardless of, you know, that psychological barrier, but you know, mentally it, it, that was, it was tough, it was challenging. But luckily I can still attempt to do it during the day because it's like a graveyard Mm -hmm. situation i'm typically did you do that on purpose yes <laughs> correct i i did it on purpose so uh so tell me your again, schedule what's your schedule like <clears throat> 3 a.m it's typically 3 a.m to 9 a.m in the morning and then i'll come home eat take a little nap wake up around 11 30 noon and try to get some real estate deals you know I oh, that's a have... quick ass nap god damn <laughs> well you know it's my my you know that 3 a.m to to 9 in the morning i thought it was really gonna mess my circadian rhythm and my whole you know i'm gonna be working all night and sleeping all day but for me it's more so like you woke up a few it's just like you wake up really really early early and you're just working a different Correct. job but you're still thinking about the other thing exactly so yeah. when i come home it's hard to like it's not like i go to bed i'll get yeah. sleepy and crash out and need to take a little nap but if the sun is high in the sky and it's like 1130 noon, like, you know, I'll crack my eyes open. It's like, all right, got that power and, nap. And like, mm -hmm. now we're into the day. It's not like I'm going to go to bed for the, you know what I mean? Rest when do day, you go so. to bed? When do you like 6 p.m. or something like that? No, see, I go to I still only go to bed probably between the nine and 10 o'clock sometime. Oh, I'm usually sleep by 10. So if anything, this is the good thing. When yeah. this FedEx situation comes to the end and we work the real estate thing out, it's really honed in on my sleep schedule because now 
yeah. a going to bed at 10, 10 30 and waking up at like five 30 sounds ideal. Yeah, like yeah. That sounds like a piece <laughs> of cake. You know what I mean? I've conditioned myself to go to bed yeah. on time and waking up early, waking up at five, five 30. That's easy. Compared that's to like two yeah. is nothing. So yeah, that's yeah. one, that's one good thing about it. Like it, it's yeah. nailed down a pretty good sleep schedule. How, how long do you see yourself working at FedEx? True, Man, truth, I, I, truthfully. Thir- 30 more days. Oh shit. Yeah. I was not expecting that. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's 30 more days because it's, uh, the thing about the FedEx, this is, this is the point. This is the place where I'm at financially, bro. Like it got so bad due to the lack of real estate deals that the, like in the back of my mind, the re- doing real estate deals is still the only thing that can save me. So I strategically did that graveyard FedEx situation to do the de- like there's no circumstance where the FedEx saves me. So mm. if in 30 days I still don't have some type of pipeline of potential real estate money coming in, I'm going to have to go get like a job a career sales commission job job. Oh, so you, you might get- transition if it doesn't work out in 30 days with full-time pipeline of real estate, you're like I'm fucked. I got to go back to the actual career shit. Correct. Full fledged workforce energy. Cause, oh, the, cause you get what I'm saying? So the FedEx was more so like buying me time, time. and mm-hmm. flexibility to still do real estate. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I get it, it wasn't like, you know, the money that I'm making there is just enough to, you know, eat your, your bare essentials. You yeah. Know, yeah. You yeah. Pay your utilities and gas and eat just to have something. Cause it was mm-hmm. about to get, we were yeah. we were about to get the zero. You know yeah, 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 yeah. But so, now you're just you're buying time, but but you don't have like this FedEx isn't isn't giving you that lifestyle you want where you can invest, where you can save, enjoy vacation. It's just bare necessities so you can focus on real estate. A hundred percent. Because bro, like it's still financially, I'm still trending in the wrong direction. Yeah. Keep waking up every day doing the FedEx, helping my guy at landscaping part time. Like I'm now physically working six, eight, ten hours a day still trending you know both of them combined still don't cover my baseline yeah yeah you know what i mean to the point where i can get out of the hole financially they're just buying me time before the facts the end you know so it's like hey if this doesn't work out in the next 90 days or so in about 30 days it'll be 90 days it's like you know all right now we got to find some gainful salary commission sales Full time. What would you employment. do? Back to Verizon. <laughs> that, that's a great question. I, it would have to. I would. I would prefer, and I'm under the assumption that it would have to be some type of sales commission structured position, mm-hmm. so that there's no hard cap on my income. Mm-hmm. Um, but brother, I don't. I, I can't even answer that. You know, after eight years, you got you being, got thirty years. I, I mean, you got thirty yeah, days. Thirty days. Yeah, <laughs> like, I, I couldn't tell you. But I don't know. Sell insurance. Sell cars. I would sell something. It would. I would assume that it would be in some type of commission-based sales structure. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Interesting. Okay. Well, you still got your license too. Your real estate license. Would you? Well, see, that's suspended. My real. Uh, that, that's a that's a story in itself. Um, and it actually just suspended on my birthday, May thirtieth, because I, very very long story short, um, I spent the majority of my time the past three years wholesaling real estate. And that got back to my brokerage and some brokerages don't like that or love that. It's not Uh illegal. I'm not doing anything illegal. I'm not doing anything like that. But some ways I I was a terrible agent in the sense that my brokerage manager would want, you know, you got the continuing education stuff. You have that traditional real estate culture and I would never want anything to do with that. So the Mm -hmm. broker managers was, hey, come in and speak at this event. We know you're flipping houses. We know you're doing investment stuff. Come talk to our people. Come talk to our, and I would just be like, no, 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 bro. I literally wanted somewhere to just hang my license. Yeah. You know, like I'm not doing anything traditional retail at the moment. The wholesale's on fire. The off market's on fire. So that got back to my, and, and again, agents don't like wholesalers. And there's still a significant gap in understanding of where we can both, like how we can both coexist together, at least in this market. Um, so again, our the brokerage that I was with was more of a bigger, they didn't, 
you know, they suggested that it's their in-house policy that you can't assign contract. So my real estate attorney was like, listen, before you try to argue with them, before you try to just send your license somewhere else, like hang were your they license try, at a, what, what were they trying to like reprimand? Were they just trying to suspend your license and kick you out? Or were they trying to ask for money back? Well, no, they were, they were trying to, they're suggesting, they literally tried to suggest that they have an in-house policy that we don't, because wholesaling in theory is brokering real estate without mm -hmm. a license. Mm -hmm. But at this, which in theory is true, mm -hmm. but it is still 100% illegal for me to show up, not as an agent, but mm -hmm. as Right Real Estate Solutions and investor mm -hmm. who has the intent and the ability to close on this contract mm -hmm. if I needed to and assign my interest to another entity for a fee. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. legal. But they couldn't, they're like, well, representing our bro, like they couldn't understand that, like, hey, I'm showing up as my own entity. I don't show up. I don't have that, to show up just because I have a license as yeah, yeah. a realtor for yeah. said brokerage. Yeah. And they were like, well, our in-house company, like it's illegal and all this. And, and I'm like, it's not illegal. So long story short, what they did was they sent, they kicked me out of the brokerage uh -huh. and they just sent my license back to the state. Uh, but this was in the summer of 2021 when I was uh, doing, okay. the, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm like, I, I call my attorney. He's like, okay, no big deal. Your license is in escrow. Right. Mm -hmm. So since then, I just, bro, I never needed it. I wasn't yeah, doing yeah, any yeah. retail stuff. It's been, in, and you know, you need the 30 hours of continuing education before your birthday every three years, which was just on the 30th. So now it is in a suspended status. And I have one more year to figure out um, what do I have to do? I, I do have to retake the state and national exam to reactivate it, but I have like two more years actually to do that because that'll be 10 years. If I go past 10 years and don't do anything, everything starts over. But within the next two years will be my 10 years of having it. Mm. I thought if they I were going to try and uh, go after you for all the wholesale money that you made. No, 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 no. They just said like, hey, at our brokerage, because again, they, bro, like I wasn't doing anything illegal. They were just, yeah. we don't want our agents affiliated. And I was using like my DocuSign and dot loop that was... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. offered by the company. So she was just all in my transaction. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Wait yeah. a minute. We are missing out on like, how come you're not listing these houses? And my mm. my attorney was just like, bro, don't, you know, because I, you know, I liked hanging my license there. And they're like, listen, don't argue with them. Hang your license somewhere else. And I've yet to, you know, call right. these, you know, I need to call around to different brokerages that are more investor friendly, that don't yeah. care. I just want to hang my license somewhere. And I never got around to that because I wasn't using it. So that's the story on, on my sense. actual license. I want to move. I want to move on to uh, the hella misguided segment where I ask the same question to each entrepreneur that comes mm -hmm. up here. That question is simple. It is: If you were to write a letter to your eighteen-year-old self, what would a summary of that letter be? Oh man, uh, be unapologetically yourself. Okay. Um, live authentically, true to who you really are. Um develop high income skill sets and take care of yourself take be really really good to yourself hmm. because like you know at 18 i thought 30 was a far away and mm -hmm. i thought when i got to 30 it's like man Life's i done. going to that's old and like yeah, done yeah. but now that i just turned 35 I really physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally feel like, man, I'm just getting started. Yeah. So at 18, I would definitely tell myself like, man, you better take care of yourself yeah. because like this shell, this vessel, this body has to last a long time. And I have, but like develop high income skills, live your life relationally, professionally, spiritually, authentically true to yourself and physically take optimal premium care of yourself. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I think that's very important. And as I'm getting older, I'm 29. Uh, you're right. Like at 18, you're like, damn, that's old. Like I'm supposed to be married, kids, mansion. Like it yeah. just it doesn't it, uh, it doesn't all happen like that. Right. But um, I do want to ask because you've kind of been at both. You've kind of been at like all stages of life. Right. For you sure. Grew, you grew up in the suburbs. So you, you got that middle class feel for sure you've made it forty five thousand dollars a month 
So you got sure. that, you know, that high ceiling of where you're living in luxury and then you lost it all, right? And you got that where you almost hit zero financially and you almost and you hit zero mentally and emotionally, right? So now that you've kind of hit all stages, what seems to be most important to you? Like what? And when I say this, like what stands out to you? Because they say, you know, money doesn't buy happiness. And I and I can get into my thoughts on that. I think it can buy happiness. Now, sure. whether, I agree. whether, yeah. Now, but what truly makes you happy, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. You've had it all. So when you sure. had the money, was there there was obviously still something missing, right? Which caused the, the divorce. But now that you are at ground zero again, you're you're still happy, you're alive and well. What what's kind of like the difference if you, you get what I'm getting? Yeah, at? no, I, I understand the difference. Life at, at this stage at 35, like I said, being married with a bunch of kids young, making multiple six figures a few years ago to being you know, barely surviving at this point and, you know, navigating the ebbs and flows of life in general. Um, that's what it's all about, navigating the middle. I feel like us as humans, our human experience, like we want to, we're more connected to the extremes than we are the middle. So meaning not just the good extremes and the good highs of lives, but even when it's, have you noticed, like, even when it's really, really bad, like we really lean into like, oh, life is over. And then this, you know, when it's really, really high and good, we lean into that and we connect there and we stay there and we like that. And we're seeking this thrill and excitement and high. And even when it's low, it's like we lean into that too. Like, oh, I'm mm -hmm. depressed. Oh, I'm anxious. Oh, it's mental illness. Oh, I need to, you know, therapy and like life is miserable. And I feel like the overwhelming majority of time spent in our life in this human existence is the middle space. But yeah. I think we misinterpret the middle for boring, for unexciting, for, you know what I mean? A lot of the times like we self-sabotage ourselves when it's not too high. Like, why can't we just exist and be content in a space where, how's it going, Demetrius? Hey, nothing too excitingly good is going on, but at the same time, nothing too tragically bad is going on either. And it's like we sabotage it. Like it's got to be because our it's got to be either it's crazy the extreme. Yeah, like we do something to. So I would say that like not misinterpreting the middle space, which is the majority of our existence, as really really good or bad. Like it's just okay. Why can't we, you know what I mean? When you talk to people, it's just like, how you doing? I'm I'm just well, you know what I'm saying? Not too high, not too low, and that's not a problem. Mm. So therefore I don't have to do anything to cultivate this extreme, good or bad. You know what I mean? Like finding a place of contentment. Um, and that's like where you said, so having had all the money and not having the money, like I crave more than anything else, bro, to wake up tomorrow and not be in need of anything like i'm in a space where i want functionality you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying it's like we think we want a lambo and a big mansion but it's just like where i live that's not conducive where am i going to drive that like that's not <laughs> have you ever been in a lambo like it's not a functional <laughs> daily driver it's uncomfortable it like, is you know, that you know yeah <laughs> and it's like have you ever been in a big mansion it's just like bro like the that's... overwhelming majority of my time spent is going to be in my one common space in my bathroom and yeah. in my bed <laughs> so it's just like i want more than anything functionality just functional i want like transportation and lifestyle and comfort and provision at a functional base level like i'm not in dire need for anything yeah you know what i mean like peace and flexibility and freedom is like and i feel like that's found in that middle space so yeah. not having the desire to chase the extremes is is how I would, you know, answer that question. That's fire. I like that. I never really thought about that. We do desire extremes, whether it's good or bad, and we are not content with being in the middle, like just as a human being. And right. I, I think like now with you saying that, that's like literally the podcast is it's okay to be in the middle and in a, in a struggling business owner, right? Like Correct. it's okay to be there, right? maybe not forever but don't sure. feel ashamed to be there and so sure. that that was really well said for sure um yeah. 
one um ah, I just had a fire question. Where did it go? Somewhere in my head. Um I can't, I can't remember it. Damn it. Oh, <laughs> where do you see yourself in in 5 years? Oh man, in 5 years I see myself uh I see myself financially free. I see mm. myself living a life with margin. I see myself living fully on my terms and conditions because I've now been able to more clearly than ever before define what that freedom is for me and define it. I know what it looks like and feels like clearly and I'm unapologetic about it because it's true to who I really am. I'm yeah. no longer pursuing things that I think I need based upon a cultural narrative, based upon society's narrative. Uh, I've lived long enough and experienced enough good and bad where I can come out of that, you know, unapologetic about, you know, how I want to live, what I want to acquire. And uh, so I see myself free. I see myself with margin and I definitely see myself ending financial suffering for me and the people that I love. Fire. I love it. I love it. Well, we just hit the hour mark. I know we both got to sure. go get this money. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm I'm gonna wrap it up. The way I like to wrap it up is uh, with a segment called "Guided Conclusions," where um, I get to pick a question that we didn't talk about previously to this um, mm -hmm. to this recording. Um, that question could be serious, it could be funny, it could be sad. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Would you walk? Would you rather walk behind someone who walks? slightly slower than you would like or would you have to skip everywhere so you're anywhere you go someone is walking in front of you at a slower pace that makes you mm -hmm. a little bit annoyed or you have to literally skip everywhere you go slow slow why um because i feel like that's the middle you know what i mean like remember when mm. i uh, the, in the last slower is more conducive to the middle space that the majority of our existence will be in so me not having this Damn. need to chase the extreme which is speed Damn. or you know like this isn't going fast enough i'd rather slow down it's more sustainable to slow down than it is to speed up long term dude that was like that was a full circle right there. You just wrapped it around. That was really good. That was like, I don't even, that was like a Bible. That was like what a preacher yeah. does at church. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that was yeah, good, we man. Had, we had to make it make sense, right? Yeah. Hey, and that, and that was total red. We didn't talk about that mm -hmm. question. So like, no. that was, that was really well put together. Yeah. I, that makes sense. And that's a great way to end the episode. So uh, I'm sure for we sure, could talk bro. forever, but that was, that was amazing. Go ahead and let everyone know where they can find you. And obviously it got to be your Twitter because your Twitter is fire and you, you produce really good content. Well written. So. Yeah. And, and you know, I hate this. Maybe we'll do something in the show notes in terms of all my social media handles, but Demetrius, right. You can find me everywhere. I don't even know I'm underperforming on my social media, <laughs> so I don't even know it off the top of my head. Um, but Demet if you put in Demetrius, right, you'll find me on Instagram, Twitter, all the above, uh, meets, right. Something like that. We'll put it in the, I'll, <laughs> I'll send it to you. I'm pretty sure you'll put it somewhere for your sure, followers man. to find me, but I appreciate your time, bro. Like this was fun. Yeah, no, nah, this was this is a great time, man. We, uh, I hope you have a great day. And everyone listening, make sure you like, subscribe, share this episode. This has been really good. We, we touched on a lot of topics today, especially marriage, um, mistakes in marriage, mistakes in business, and, and just not being ashamed of any of it. So um, I appreciate I appreciate it. Uh, you heard it here. This is the Misguided Podcast. We're intending to guide you to a better future. My name is Juwan sitting here with Demetrius. Make sure you like and subscribe. I'll see you on the other side. For sure.